let me start by saying how much how your movie's awesome. Oh, thanks! And I, I'm, listen, I'm sure you're hearing that from everyone, but I'm sure it doesn't hurt after you've spent years working on it. It's nice one-on-one. -on -one. Right. Um, so, uh, what, I'm, I have so many questions for you, but I guess I'm going to start with, after Logan, I'm assuming you had things you were thinking about doing. What was it about Ford Ferrari that said, I want to do this next? Well, it was even before Logan. Um, it was a story I had been tracking, actually before I made the Japanese saga, Wolverine. The interesting thing is I came into Fox, they had this um, idea under development at Fox, and I came in um, to see the president of the studio at that point, and Watts, it still is, and said, I want to do this, and was the fourth Ferrari material. And, and she, was, she explained to me that there was another uh, director and another package attached to it at that point, and that they were not leaving any time soon, although she didn't know if it was going to happen. And then she gave me um, the newly freed um, Chris Macquarie script for Wolverine, and I was actually the meeting when Wolverine started because Darren had just left, had just left the project, and um, it was fortuitous that I was coming to meet about Ford Ferrari. And um, so since then, I've been tracking it, and and um, and after Logan, the material had come free, and I jumped on and got immediately to work with others on the script. And the main thing that had kept the movie from happening, thank God, all those years was um, that it cost too much. And um, so my big job was to figure out how to get it under $100 million and do a uh, period accurate racing movie with real cars and real action and not all CG. And, and that's what the Butterworth line also strengthened characters and some other stuff. But I wanted to really figure out how to make this thing happen in a way that was both spectacular and real movie, but also wasn't a ridiculous amount of money because obviously studios are nervous these days about it projects that don't feature a famous piece of talent for comic books or an IP or something that immediately attracts the audience. Well, that's one of the things that I'm so happy about this movie is that it's such a smart adult movie and it's so, listen man, it's, it's so well done, but I was going to say it's so challenging to make these movies nowadays. It is. I mean, you, well, I really have to thank Logan. I mean, honestly, the, the, the energy and the fan love and the dollars and cents of Logan and, um, really helped me with this man. You get in the editing room, what are you so excited about and what are you a little bit nervous about? With this movie, it was all about length. I, ha I was really excited about the picture while shooting. I had seen a lot of it cut together. We were kind of getting one sequence shot at a time, so the editing room would have a time to complete sections of the movie while we're still shooting. And it looked, I honestly was very excited about the picture. My greatest nervousness was that the tapestry of it all was, was you know, my the first cut I saw in the movie was three and a half hours. So it was a full Irishman. And, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> Wait, and, was it an assembly cut or was it a cut that you were like pretty happy it a, with? It was a handsome cut. My editors don't even, whatever they call assembly, my editors, um, Mike McCusker and, uh, and his team, they all, they work on showing me a version of the movie. I mean, obviously there's stuff that's going to be rough, but no, it isn't like sloppy. I mean, it's sloppy in the sense that there's stuff that should come out because it's too long. But it's not sloppy in that anything looks awkward. I, and also, by the way, I've been working with them the whole shoot, meaning they'll send me scenes, I send them notes, I'll come in on a Saturday and go through a cut with them. So what I'm seeing after about two weeks after I wrap, it's obviously missing visual effects and set extensions and the music may be rough. And But it's it's a you can, if you've done this a while, you know, you know, what you're looking at and um and i knew we were when you're cutting over an hour out of a movie that looks pretty good at three and a half hours it's hard because you're having to cut one of every three minutes you watch when you're watching it and that's, that's a lot of so that's I, a lot of time i guess i'm gonna have to ask the most important question as a fan of your movie and your work um when are you going to show me the the, the three and a half hour long version cu uh, the, cut when, the, when can i see that well, the, we were talking about doing something, at least putting the additional scenes maybe on the Blu-ray, if Blu-rays still exist by the time this movie makes I, it. I to think the it video. will. Good. I'm confident. Well, we're, we've been talking with Fox about that. I'm sometimes torn about whether to, to have alternate versions of movies because I feel like um, I, I, I literally have an argument inside myself. Some filmmakers I admire just put out their, the finished work, and that's that. And some put out alternates and whatever, and it's kind of like I'm 
sometimes confuse what the best well, course of action is. It's so interesting because, I mean, the famous story is that Kubrick burned the negative of anything he didn't use. Right. And so he wanted he wanted the version he finished to be the version, period. Right. But then you have moments where, like, he showed 2001, I guess the first screening was longer, and then after that f- first world premiere, he removed whatever it was, five well, or the seven. legend is that he trimmed the prints. Yes. That it was so late that he was actually trimming the answer prints of the movie before release. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, there's a hard splice in all the prints. Sure. And but you also I think about like someone like Woody Allen and the, all the stuff that's missing from like Manhattan and all these other things that we'll never see. You know? Yeah, I know. It's a very confusing question. Right. So I guess my thing is you obviously so you have a three and a half hour cut, you then We is, work on finding what's the essence of the story. I mean, I didn't think, by the way, it should be a three and a half hour movie. It was long. And but by the time we got to like 245 it was a very good movie at 245 so it was just about do we need this do we need this do we need this and a lot of it you're you're thinking about um uh, there's people who just don't want to see a movie that long you're also thinking about the fact that that does it work if it works leaner then it doesn't need it meaning there's a school of thought that if i can take this out and it doesn't hurt anything then i should take it out and um we just kept working till we realized we were at a point where we wouldn't what i was at a point where if I did more, I would like the movie less. I was at a peak of thinking the movie was sharp. We put it in front of audiences. And it was still, remember, I'm getting Fox to release a $90 million, two and a half hour movie. And we're going in front of audiences. And they're loving it in, t- in tests. But there's also a contingent that are saying, it's not sharp, dude. And so I couldn't go backward. But I also didn't want to cut any more. And the studio was very kind in the sense that there's a lot of studios that would, would still be like, at two hours and 25 minutes, that's still too much. And they weren't. They, we, we all agreed this is the best place to stop. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking, man, I, I'm going to do my final question about the editing and say, what was the last thing or two that you cut out of the movie that almost made it in the film? Do you remember? Uh, I, it, it's, it's not that exciting to describe. There's a longer conversation between Bernthal and Matt Damon at a, at a, a Mustang release that is a beautiful piece of acting and a long tracking shot I did with them that came out because I realized the movie didn't require it. And, and, um, but it's the last piece I took out because I was quite fond of it. The other thing that, that you should know watching it is that the, the, in the terms of cutting is that the races were where the, we were continually massaging, learning from sound, learning, finding a new piece, doing... We were really working a long time on getting the races right, particularly the last almost hour-long race. For those of you in the audience who haven't seen the movie, the movie's kind of a straight drama with a little bit of racing for almost 90 minutes, and then the last hour is almost nothing but racing. Um, it's. I always would say to the crew, it's like a reverse Private Ryan. You open with this... In Private Ryan, of course, you open with this insane action, and then the movie becomes kind of a Western drama. And this movie is the opposite. It's kind of an ensemble piece building and building toward a 50-minute race at the end. Yeah. Um, okay, so my final thing. So you think that there's a chance for fans of the movie like me that we could get a longer thing on the Blu-ray? We will see. Right. There's so, a chance. There's, yeah. Steve, there's a chance of anything. That, yeah, there's but no one who sits in this couch who couldn't, with you grinning and begging, tell you there's a chance. There's a chance of anything. Sure. Um, I definitely want, obviously, filming these racing scenes, which are fantastic, you obviously have a second unit director. I believe it was Darren Prescott? Yes. And so I'm curious, how do you work with Darren to craft these things? And because they look so realistic and well done. Well, that's a credit to Darren and his team of uh, stunt guys and race drivers, and our, also our car team was phenomenal in this movie. We had a we were running a, a kind of incredibly large vintage garage running at all times on this movie with cars coming in broken off the set to be repaired, others going out. We were running essentially Shelby American, um, only we were fixing Ferraris, Porsches, Shelby's, um, Fords, uh, you name it, and Aston Martins. Um, so we had a kind of we had an expert battery of mechanics working on both vintage cars and some were uh, more modern engines with a skin on them. Um, but one way or another, they all had to drive and crash and then be back come back out on the road again. That was part of our budget saving effort. Was we wanted to do it real, but we had to have some kind of system by which we could put everything out on the road. The real thing Darren and I worked on was planning um, because the most amazing thing 
um, after you see this movie, you'll have to remember this because it doesn't sound that amazing until you've seen the movie, but Le Mans doesn't exist anymore in the form it did in the mid-60s, meaning in, in the mid-60s and earlier, Le Mans was three and a half miles of kind of country roads connected by um, just by turns, you know, at stop signs. They make the turns of the stop signs, and then they go past what was a kind of older-style grandstand like you see in the movie. And none of that exists anymore. It all looks like Staples Center in France now. It's the same basic track, only it's more professionally graded, and it's got professional pits and tons of stands. So we couldn't shoot there. So we needed to somehow put together a simulation of what Le Mans was in the early 60s. Um, and for the racing experts, it's a very specific track. There's, there's many turns and twists and straightaways that have very specific names and have a very specific look. The, the, you know, the Mulsan straight is, is, is two miles, uh, is a mile of, of a straightaway with poplar trees on one side and da 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 and, and, and pastures for cows on the other. So we scouted and we found many of these locations in different parts of Atlanta, which is where Darren ended up shooting that stuff with us. And then the grandstand we built in California at an abandoned airport. And um, because if you think about it, if you need cars to drive over 100 miles an hour past your camera, you don't just need road for them to drive on. You need road for them to get up to over 100 miles an hour on. You can't just, sure. they can't, even race cars don't go zero to 100 in one second. So you need a long straightaway. So um, every time what this is getting to, you see a car complete one one circle around the Le Mans track, you are seeing it pass through six different discrete locations. Um, California is the starting line where the, with the grandstand. The Dunlop Bridge is a different location in Atlanta. Then the next set of curves is another location in Atlanta. The Mulsanne Strait is a very rural location of, of farmland we found in Atlanta with the poplar trees and the cow pastures. And then you're back in another area of Atlanta on an actual racetrack, and then you're back in California. What does this mean as a filmmaker? It means that if you've got three cars in three different positions and it's raining, to do one circle around that track, you've got to shoot those three cars in matching positions in California, in five different locations in Atlanta, and then back in California with the lighting conditions and the rain and the dirt level on the track and everything else all matching to make this stuff cut. And that editorially... Um, Stunt-wise and um, visual effects-wise, physical effects-wise, was one of our greatest challenges is that we wanted to make all these different locations pull together into one seamless reality. Um, I'm already giving the wrap-up signal. I have about a thousand other questions. I'm, I'm trying sorry to... for the long answer. No, no, no. I'm trying to think of what my last thing is going to be with you. You got, you got an extra few minutes. No, I, 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 I'll sit here. You'll, I think she'll kill me. Her name's Carol. Carol. I love her. Don't kill him. Right. He's going over by two minutes. <laughs> uh uh, so no matter what movie you're making, you never have enough time. You never have enough money. You're, you're I didn't say that. No. I didn't say that. But I know what you mean as a general thing. Yeah, you're always. You, they were very generous in this movie. We finished on time. It was very realistically made. Um, no, what I'm curious about though is, you. So you're getting ready to shoot. Yeah. What's the thing that you're most nervous about being besides, well, actually anything about being able to pull off with the limitations that you're given. My greatest anxiety was that I wanted the characters to come to life, and I felt like I had I wanted the ensemble to come to life in the world. I wanted to invite the audience into this world. I felt like this meeting of corporate politics of the '60s in Ford and all, and and Lee Iacocca and all his folks, and the kind of hot rodders and greasers and mechanics of the Shelby American world, and then the um, and then of course the kind of the elite brilliance of the Ferrari world. All these worlds coming together was what I was most concerned with getting right. Um, I felt like, and, and in an entertaining way, that it didn't feel like a documentary. You know, you'll notice when you see the movie, there are no dates or little subtitles telling you where you are. I, I feel like even period movies and historical movies sometimes get overwhelmed with the facts. And I want you to get overwhelmed with the drama. And that was sure. really my big, my big interest is that we have a lot of action movies these days, but not many of them have characters that you really care about, other than maybe liking the people who are playing them, that, that you're actually involved in these characters' lives. And I am always interested, because it's what I grew up on, is the great action movies where you really cared about the characters and you saw their psychological issues playing themselves out in the action as opposed to the action 
just being what we've gotten to now, which is like an arms race with the last movie. Can we do something bigger and better than the last but guy? That, that's the thing, and this is how I'm ending. The, the longer running time and the structure of your film allows you, after that hour and a half, where you're not worried about the action, if you will, that I actually give a shit about who these people are. That's true, Steve. So The other thing that helps is when you're not making a movie, and forgive me, 12, 13-year-olds who are watching, but when you're not making a movie for a ADD kind of 13-year-old mind, you also don't have this rule that populates the head of many studios, which is that you just need some action every five to eight minutes or so to keep your young audience engaged and that you, this movie doesn't have that. And what the advantage is, even financially, which is what you're getting to, is that when you don't feel the need that every, every five to eight minutes you need some kind of spike of action, you can actually save that money and move it down the line so when you finally do get in action, you've got all the resources you would have poured into 12 mini sure. wake up the audience action beats into one mega action beat, which is kind of what I'm, you know, Private Ryan, even Rocky, in a way, is a very light on fighting until the end. And and it's like, that. these are all examples to me of where they save their resources and then they blow your mind in the third act. Yeah, I, I want to give a huge thank you to 20th Century Fox for making your movie because it is so hard to Emma make Watts, these... Emma Steve Asbell, and all, even the incoming folks at Disney who have been really supportive since they came in. It's a, But it was a lot of courage on their part because these are the kind of movies that Studio Boss get hung for because if they don't work there there's nothing to blame you can't say oh well i made it because it was a best-selling book or i made it because there's so many fans out there can't say any of those things it just has to be i made it because i believed in the picture completely my last thing for you and i and, and hopefully a brief answer i'm a big fan of your work a lot of people watching this on the site are big fans of your work i know you you're just finished but have you thought about what you might try to accomplish next of course are you willing to share of course not. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. I'll leave it there and say that. Uh, Let's least, talk in a few months, right, and I'll I, talk all about it. I completely understand. Um, seriously, congrats on your movie. I'm so it's so so awesome. Thank you, Steve. And um, uh, keep up the good work here. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to hold you to letting me see the longer cut. And on that note, we'll see. if I, I get never to see offered it. that, Steve. No, he said that. You I all, didn't. You I watched didn't the say interview, it. and he Gotta said, "Gotta go. Gotta right, go."